Uh, warm greetings and good evening from the Chennai Center for China Studies. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to today's institutional dialogue on the topic Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping. The Chinese Communist Party was formed in 1921 and established the People's Republic of China in 1949. Since 1949, it has ruled over China, making it one of the most stable single party systems in the world. Today, the PRC has been increasingly assertive in its foreign policy, which has led many scholars and analysts to conclude that it is directly correlated with President Xi Jinping's consolidation of power within the party. As the CCP commemorates its 100th anniversary, this presents an opportunity to study the CCP, also relevant and pertinent today because of Xi Jinping's policy on the domestic front and in the global arena. The series of webinar with experts by the Chennai Center for China Studies will take a closer look at how the Chinese Communist Party has evolved in terms of themes, concepts, reforms, and especially under President Xi Jinping. For combining these pieces of the puzzle provides a comprehensive picture of this political organization. To present this topic today, we have distinguished speaker, Dr. Amrita Jash. Dr. Amrita Jash is a research fellow at the Center for Land Warfare Studies, New Delhi. She co-edited the book on COVID-19 and its challenges, Is India Future Ready? with Lieutenant General Dr. V.K. Ahuvalia in 2019. And in 2021, she authored a book titled The Concept of Active Defense in China's Military Strategy. She holds a PhD in Chinese studies from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is also the managing editor of the Class Journal. Dr. Jash is a Pavit Fellow and has been a visiting fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies, University of Cambridge. She has been an adjunct faculty at the School of Global Affairs, Ambedkar University, and a visiting faculty at the Department of Chinese, Sikkim Central University, a UGC graduate fellow from 2012-2017, a US-India-China Initiative Fellow, John Hopkins University in 2013. She was also a researcher under China's Ministry of Commerce in 2014, a researcher under Harvard Engineering Nanjing Program in 2015. In 2019, under the then Chief of Army Staff, General Bipin Rawat, she was awarded for her contributing to the field of Chinese studies. Dr. Jash has researched, uh, Dr. Jash research has appeared in 13 edited books, peer reviewed journals such as East Asian Policy, Review of Global Politics, Strategic Analysis, Yonsei Journal, China Report, Maritime Affairs and Strategic Vision, among several others. She has published with CSIS, RUSI, RSIS, Pacific Forum, Think China, Huffington Post, International EIR, Asia Times, and Crawford School, among several others. Thank you, Dr. Amrita Jash, for being with us here today. Today's discussion is chaired and moderated by Mr. Rajana Muthukrishnan, distinguished member C3S. Dr. Rajana Muthukrishnan is a director of Voice Map Services Private Limited, a Chennai based IT solutions company that specializes in developing innovative voice based solutions. Mr. Rajaram started his career in 1989 in Hong Kong with the then Commission for India, Indian Consulate, as then it was known in Hong Kong, and later held the position of Assistant Secretary General of the Indian Chamber of Commerce, Hong Kong. In this capacity, he has traveled extensively in China and been part of several international and national trade and business delegations. He has been the Chamber representative in some of the consultative committees of the Hong Kong government. After returning to India in 2002, he entered the IT industry as head of insurance business and consulting for Polaris Software Lab, where he set up their insurance vertical, including a joint venture with AIG. He later became the head of insurance practice for India and South Asian region in IBM's global business consulting business, and then became one of the eight persons designated as global subject matter expert for insurance. He is also a passionate researcher and defense enthusiast and has written on matters related to international strategic affairs and, spoke, and spoken on national security issues to create better awareness about these subjects. Thank you very much, sir, for graciously accepting our invitation to chair and moderate this discussion. With these words, I would like to hand over the floor to my uh, director, Kamudur Aras Basan, Indian Navy Retired, for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Bala. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, special welcome to Dr. Amrita Jash and uh, Raja Ramadakrishnan. It's a great pleasure having you both here with us. A highly accomplished uh, and uh, specialist in the topic. You know, as Bala has brought out, uh, these are the series of uh, lectures that we have plan planned uh, in Chennai Centre for China Studies. And we kicked off the event yesterday with Ambassador Gautam Bambawale's talk on uh, party policies and people under Xi as uh, the, the, they celebrated the, the centenary. 
and it was moderated yesterday by ambassador uh, ganapati was also here and a very interesting discussion that we had and uh, uh, some of the issues that were flagged related to you know what is meant when he says a particular thing you know by today i am sure most of you would have read the speech the translations are freely available and i would have all read this but more important to read between the lines as they say now here we are trying to look at uh, some of the signals that were sent specific to taiwan you know because i think there was no compromise when it came to taiwan it's only a question of time frame as we discussed yesterday and the other thing was also about the the steel wall you know it, this was given a prominence in many papers and uh, you know uh, commentaries but to say that uh, you know this is a kind of resolve that these 1.4 billion people will have under the party and uh, they will ensure that uh, nobody will challenge them so uh, in addition to that ambassador ganapati made a important observation it's also been noted by some of the other newspapers that uh, uh, ji came uh, to the podium uh, in mao's jacket uh, you know say saying you know that he is perhaps the most important leader of the mao and he follows him in his footsteps in terms of establishing supremacy of the party under one leader so uh, we do look forward to your talk and the interaction and uh, we also have many more which are coming up in the part i just like to keep others informed on what we planned i uh, you know we have one which is coming up on uh, 13th uh, which is going to be an interesting discussion between uh, uh, professor kerry uh, who has written the book on political warfare and we are going to have the discussion on that uh, book over here and it will be chaired and moderated by dr cleo who had participated from chatham house uh, who had participated with us uh, some time ago and then we also have general nasiman uh, who you know we are tying up with him to have this talk before the 10th and that would be on the interface between the communist party and the cmc uh, the, the military commission so you know we are trying to uh, see what we can uh, uh, infer uh, from all that has been said and all that has not been said and uh, this is where uh, the the inputs that we are going to get today from dr amrita would be of great relevance to us and you know and uh, with all this asitrias will be in a better position uh, to look at and analyze you know what to expect as far as india is concerned in terms of these developments at at uh, at uh, cpc at 100 and then how do we counter some of these challenges that have been thrown at us so uh, without taking too much of time from my side because there's so much that one can talk about it but uh, the floor is yours dr amrita and uh, all the questions will of course be towards the end of your talk and they'll all be posted in the chat box in the interest of time and uh, you can uh, choose them uh, club them together uh, as is required and uh, now i'll request uh, uh, mr rajaram uh, to take over uh, chair the session and moderate it thank you uh, over to you dr rajaram thank you commodore namaste everybody and uh, warm welcome to all and especially to dr amrita jats uh, it's a pleasure to chair and moderate the event today um, to introduce amrita i think bala has done it already so i think we should not stand in the way of the main speaker so i'll keep my opening comments very short and crisp uh, i today's topic is uh, chinese communist party under xi jinping uh, we know that there has been a tumultuous journey of 100 years that precedes uh, where we stand today uh, the seeds of the origins of chinese communist party actually started much before uh, even the uh, first republic of china in the what is then called the boxer rebellion uh, which happened between 1899 and 1901 uh, that was the first major event in china which enabled the uh, non traditional rulers of china uh, to rise in revolt against foreigners uh china in its long history has had three major impacts of foreign ideology the first one was a uh, courtesy india uh, which is of course the uh, export of buddhism and uh, then the second one was more uh, malignant one again there is a, there was a role in india had to play uh, the opium was sourced from india and sent there uh, we all know that story and that was the event and the advent of the uh, foreign presence in china which then resulted in multiple foreign countries including japan uh, to hold their own spheres of influence in the under the crumbling qing dynasty and 
that opium war and its subsequent uh, reaction was the advent of the boxer rebellion which was the first time that the other major impact of foreign uh, ideology in china which is christianity and the, the cause for the boxer rebellion was the uh, um, acts by the colonials uh, christian uh, missionaries over there and the subsequent uprising against them and the violence against them so that was the first time that non traditional chinese nobility rose in rebellion and especially from the eastern uh, province of shandong so that was the first time and then then subsequently the sun yat sen era came in the republic of china so the initial inputs of that uprising was then seen even by the communist party later as a first uprising against foreigners and the influence of foreigners that searing experience of china had that had uh, with, with foreigners has been a constant in the journey of uh, all the people who have ruled china including the communist party and that has still been an abiding theme and it is still reflected in the speech made by xi jinping when he made a reference to how 1.4 billion people can uh, you know stop any kind of foreigner uh, foreign attacks on china and they will they will crush them so that's a historical uh, memory that is coming forth even today the other major abiding theme uh, theme that china has always had is it has always put a premium on stability and that overcompensates for any kind of internal fissures so any transition of power has to be at, at the lowest possible cost to uh, uh, lowest possible disturbance to this concept of stability the third important philosophical aspect that the chinese culture is hinge uh, is, uh, is underpinning on is the concept of face so any kind of internal fissures is always to be peppered over and suppressed as much as possible by using a combination of arrangements treaties uh, compromises with the most powerful one ruling the roost so contrary to many uh, popular perception that the chinese communist party is a one monolithic organization it is a kamal uh, amalgamation of uh, several layers of federation both from a regional and ethnical ethical uh, ethnic point of view as well as ideological points of view as well as class point of view so there are all types of factions which underplay and coordinate within the overall chinese communist party infrastructure and it is this balance that is uh, necessary for them to keep the communist party in control as we all know it has gone through a, a major era where uh, the the strain that i talked about of having a very centralized uh, leadership and the strong penchant for uh, stability over everything else has resulted in the communist party also acting and behaving like any other empire in china which preceded it with the red emperor being replaced uh, replacing the qing emperor and mao zedong was the uh, ultimate uh, paragon or the ultimate symbol of that red emperor model and the entire personality cult was built around him the perils of that was also known and that was undone during the era of deng xiaoping who gave the three cardinal principles of a, a, a collective leadership a graded transition through generations and a separation or a limit to the powers that uh, each power sectors will have now that has again been again reverse under the era of xi jinping as we all know and he is trying to emulate or the uh, era of chairman mao and uh, that is the cusp in of time in which we stand today i've just walked you through very briefly the origins of the communist party the abiding themes of the uh, chinese society and the current state of the communist party today i'll also mention four strategic objectives two are external facing and two are internal facing that the chinese society has worked on for many years and uh, that is uh, that is what uh, is paramount in whatever they do number one is never to allow china to be under the influence of any other foreign power and to make china stand up and reclaim its position as in uh, as one of the biggest powers in the world that is something that is always been their case the other big strategic objective is the unfinished business according to them of the unification of china 
with the question of Taiwan, and that has to be something that must be achieved. The two internal facing ones is to move the Chinese society to an era of uh, unprecedented prosperity, but at the same time, unprecedented control, a uh, controlled uh, social development. And that is the reason why the Chinese uh, Communist Party has to be at the forefront or the vanguard. And within that, the core of the Chinese Communist Party, in this case, the persona of Xi Jinping must be at the very heart of it. So that is one the internal objective. And the fourth internal objective is the complete uh, amalgamation of control of all aspects of Chinese life into and under the influence of the Communist Party again. The earlier experimentation of a market economy within the socialist structure where the Chinese party plays a role of an enabler, Communist Party plays a role of an enabler or a facilitator, or at best a regulator, is now back to where it used, where, it, where they originally planned it, that it is the controller. It is the final arbitrator and it is the final uh, say. The Communist Party has the final say in every aspect of the Chinese society. So with these comments, I would now uh, welcome uh, Dr. Anita Jash to walk us through on her assessment of uh, uh, the rise and ascent of uh, Xi Jinping, his current level of consolidation of power, and his vision for the Chinese Communist Party as it stands at the crossroads of entering the next era or the next century. Over to you, Dr. Anita Jash. Thank you very much, sir. At the very outset, I would like to uh, thank C3S for inviting me to reflect upon uh, uh, CCP under Xi Jinping. And before I begin, I would like to contextualize this very title itself, because uh, so far, when we look at China since uh, the foundation of PRC, one of the very prominent way of identifying China was that of calling it Mao's China which is prevalent like 1921 and then until 1976. So rather than calling it CCP-led China, it was Mao's China and it became much more popular under Morris Meissner's book, which was titled Mao's China. Similarly, we see that after that, we have successive three generation of leadership, excluding Tan Xiaoping. It is Xi Jinping that we are seeing a similar connotation that, you know, she's China or talking of the, at the helm of uh, affairs with that of the leadership quotient in China and how the leadership is defining the CCP-led China. So I thought that I would uh, highlight this aspect in order to, you know, contextualize my talk. So uh, what forms the benchmark is the very idea or the agenda when Xi Jinping took power. You see his agenda and uh, consistently it has been an approach where he says that, you know, loyalty to the party and he puts party at the foremost and as i quote it says that centralized and unified leadership over national security that is that is how he envisions the ccc uh, the ccp in this context when we say that uh, uh that you know we bring in or we see a transition uh, from that of hu jintao to that of Xi Jinping and my aim as I progress in the talk is to deconstruct this very agenda of centralized and unified leadership that what does Xi Jinping thinks or how has it got manifested in this last uh, you know almost uh, a to be a decade next year under the rule of Xi Jinping so what has Xi Jinping done since taking power this is one of the calculus that needs to be taken in into account. So since 2012, we see that one of the most noticeable trend has been uh, this continuing consolidation of power, which has been a characteristic feature because so far we didn't see this trend in the Chinese leadership, the way Xi Jinping has amassed power over time. She has significantly increased his authority and we can see from his official title of Ling Xu, a leader, a first ever to be given. So these, then, you know, if you join the dots, you can understand that where is it leading to. Furthermore, 
one term over we see 19 party congress she as customary reelected as the general party secretary appointed chairman of the central military commission and also his second term of presidency begins with uh, 12 with this uh, 19 party congress but successively if we see in this last 9 years he has total 13 titles that he holds and which excludes uh, for instance like apart from the general secretary and that of the president of the prc or the central military commission he is now heading multiple leading small groups so that is another a trend that one needs to look that you know what has been the transition or rather the political transition in the apparatus in the ccp's apparatus so how did she consolidate power we we see the outcome of his consolidation but how did he do that is that's where the primacy should be given if we see that his central objective was to strengthen his own power from the very beginning from own power and the mechanism to be used is by creating his loyalists and elevate his political stature and this very trend as he adopted we see there is a total bypass of the institutional norms and the constitution say as we as we'll see with what happens as evident from the 19 party congress that she succeeded given none of the six other politburo members as she is at apparent so uh, so the first setback to the customary tradition was that that there was no air apparent amongst the six politburo members furthermore enshrinement enshrinement of xi jinping thought adding further to mao zedong to tang xiaoping to that of the new edition of xi jinping thought therefore skipping the preceding two generation of leaders that is uh, jiang zemin and hu jintao and third was you know uh, so this and then calling for is his indefinite rule so these three trends have actually written new rules to china's old political structure and one man who has made these changes if we compare jiang zemin himself was also a strong uh, you know a leader but we didn't see such uh, such an attitude or you know the way to defy the norms and consolidate his power and hu jintao of course there was no such uh, uh, manifestations at all but under xi jinping we see a complete different change a total transition taking place therefore how did she climb the political ladder if you see when he took over power if you have to create loyalists how do you do that and she came up with this anti corruption campaign which is to aimed at catching tigers and the flies and this takes shape immediately after he takes his office and we see that over the 3 lakh party members have been jailed and purged successively over time but the two prime cases that shook uh the entire scenario or you know caught attention that you know this is something big was that of firstly uh the rest of koshi lai who was the former party chief of chungcheng and a member of china's pdsc and also seen as a contender of uh to xi jinping or an opponent to xi jinping because you know uh koshi lai wanted to be aimed as a new maoist faction that was coming into place the second such case was that of uh, chao yongkang who was the erstwhile oil czar and the former security chief and member of the china's politburo so two high profile political arrests was a strong sounding so he actually went for the tigers first and it also gives him political legitimacy to uh, you know amongst the chinese populace that you know he is not leaving any scope for even if you are the most powerful but the if i if one reads in between the lines the the agenda was far more personal 
yes there was a political sounding but also a personal connotation because by doing so she prevents any form of challenge to his authority so there is no opponents to his power and then after these arrests the other major uh, a major um, step taken by Xi Jinping was in the form of creation of the National Supervision Commission, which got established in 2018 and was the uh, and is the anti-corruption watchdog, one of the most powerful new government agency which is above China's judiciary. So this also shows that you know the very fact of where do you position this new agency is very important or a significant uh, step forward in terms of Xi's policy making. Therefore, this further centralized his authority because he does so by veiling it in an institutional setup, an institutionalization of the anti-corruption campaign. So these shifts in Chinese polity therefore suggest that under Xi Jinping, China's party system has become a one-man party, a one-man centric approach the way he is you know going in and consolidating bit by bit his power within the system by greater top-down approach so therefore if i see how he has consolidated his power it's mainly by a two-way process largely uh, and this consolidation is institutionally done so you further cannot challenge his authority. Firstly, with the constitutional amendments, that is enshrining the Xi Jinping thought to the constitution. Secondly, by abolishing the presidential term limits. So that gives him, you know, a greater session to power in, uh, in CCP, uh, CPC-led China. And finally, by incorporating a powerful new government agency under the National Supervisory Commission into China's constitution. So these three actually solidified Xi Jinping's position, or rather consolidated his power. And I would like to quote that, you know, why he, when he says that putting the party first, this has been one of his, you know, characteristic uh, uh, feature in Xi's uh, agenda. And this is very much prevalent with the message it uh, uh, sounded to the party members, as I quote, that party members should make party rules their priority and the party is adopting zero tolerance towards cliques and factions within it but one needs to understand is it the party or xi jinping that is not tolerant that is zero tolerance towards any point for kind of cliques and factions within it socialite case being uh, an exemplar to the fact therefore this clarifies that uh, she's determination towards avert all forms of challenges to its political authority. So in the name of the party and, you know, it is she's agenda that is put forward because that gives it an um, umbrella coverage or a greater, uh, you know, uh, say a, a benign uh, look of how you are putting forward your personal agenda. And furthermore, we see that in 20, uh, sorry, yeah, apart from the party, when we when I look at into the political setup, now coming to the PLA, which is another agency of the party, or the party's army, and now we can say it's a she's army with she becoming the commander in chief, the other new kind of, you know, uh, a title uh, to his name or to his power. So she has successively again strengthened his clout in terms of both personal power and new administrative authority within the Polita, within the PLA. And he has centralized the decision-making system by empowering the stature of CMC to the highest civil military authority under his chairmanship. Therefore, we see the structural reforms in the form of six departments three commissions, six offices, which CMC now has, which directly commands the military services and theaters of operations instead of, you know, rather exercising leadership role through the four 
general departments in terms of staff, the political affairs, logistics, and armament. So now if you see the hierarchy, it's Xi Jinping and then the CMC and then the other uh, branches follow. So which is again a big transition in the CPC-led framework. And uh, as one sees that in 2017, the CPC constitution was amended and it clarified that the chairperson of the CMC assumes overall responsibility for the work of the commission and that of the CMC is responsible for party work and political work in the armed forces. So again, you can see that the linkage that, you know, where it puts that the party work first, the political work first before that, you know, as a officer of the PLA. So this brings into perspective that how he has consolidated his position, not just as general secretary of the party, but also as chairman of the Central Military Commission. Therefore, one needs to assess that what tactics that she used to consolidate his power in the PLA. At the foremost, as in other civil bodies, uh, he has used that purging military personnel under corruption allegations as found almost that in initially when the, the uh, anti graft uh, was taking place. Almost 13,000 military officers have been punished over the past uh, then five years. So this was the initial uh, phase. So purging was one mechanism. Second was toppling top generals under the anti-corruption campaign, similar to what we see the Porchelai case. So we, here we see the high profile targets being made to Shu Hao or Ko Poshong and the most famous general Fang Fang Wei, who was the former chief of joint staff of the Kongchu Military Air Command. So again, he hits for the Tigers first. Third was the downsizing of the troops from 2.3 million uh, to that of 2 million. Further on, transforming from seven military regions to five theater commands. Then further down, bringing the civilian oriented frontier defense troops from the People's Armed Police under the military command, integrating China's Coast Guard into the CMC chain of command, and rapidly promoting young guards over old in Chinese military. This mechanism was also put into place. So when we combine all these, ex uh, all these actions or tactics, taken by Xi, we see that, you know, it has led to him amassing an absolute control of the armed forces. They were building a new kind of joint command and control structure with notes as the CMC, but controlled by Xi. But it very much testifies to the fact, uh, in a contrarian view, that, you know, as Mao said, that the political part from close from the barrel of the gun, but the gun is controlled by the party. But here we see the gun is controlled by the party that is led by Xi. So then again, it is the part uh, is the gun that is controlled by Xi Jinping. Apart from these changes that has taken place, which are very much, you know, highlight towards greater consolidation of Xi Jinping's own power, we also see a new kind of framework that has come into place that the CCP works under timelines under Xi Jinping. And this has been a phenomenon since he took power because immediately after taking power, he launched uh, the Chinese dream uh, which called for two centenary goals, one being met uh, on the very eve of 1st of July 2021 of creating a moderately well-off society and second in the coming that is becoming a fully developed nation by 2049. Secondly, the PLS three goals has charted out that mechanization by 2020, modernization by 2035 and world-class military by 2050. So these trends or the timelines also has become one of uh, the key trends in terms of when you define that CCP led China. Major initiatives or trademark of Xi also another like you know branding of China 
under Xi Jinping, the most famous being the Belt and Road Initiative, has again become one of the definitive features. And the second, uh, you know, the sloganeering of building a community of shared destiny, which is again China under Xi's, you know, uh, great vision to the world of building a community of shared destiny under his global governance. But we also see that, you know, as soon as she takes power, there has been great actions taken and which has led to greater turmoil because under Xi, we see that China's diplomatic relations are actually testing waters, have tested waters and, you know, are going to greater, are going to the lowest, be it United States, be it Japan, be it India. So these are few examples. But when we see immediately, if we do, if we chart out his activities, immediately he comes to power in 2013. He announces a, he builds an uh, ADIZ over Taiwan Islands in East China Sea. In 2014, we see the artificial island build up activities in South China Sea begin. In 2015 onwards, we are seeing the trade war with United States. 2017, we have Doklan standoff with India, not to forget in 2014, we had Jumar. 2020, new security law in Hong Kong. 2020 as well, Eastern Ladakh crisis with India. As well as there are speculations over the coronavirus uh, or the handling, Beijing's handling of the coronavirus. And 2021, we see new Coast Guard law. So such big steps or, you know, has been taken under Xi Jinping. He didn't even wait immediately after taking part. Generally, it is seen that, you know, you watch uh, the initial years and then you take a stronger action. But we see a stronger Xi Jinping from day one. That is also a, a new kind of trend in Chinese leadership since Xi Jinping has taken over so what can be the what are the uh, key takeaways when uh, when we look at Xi Jinping the CCP under Xi firstly the, the major uh, uh, you know assessment that goes that you know is China back to the one man rule or, or the leadership or as I would like to say CCP but more of Xi's party so there are two ways of looking at it. If one says that this one man rule, we are seeing it. What leads to this are some assessments. Firstly, we see a decisive departure uh, from Tang Xiaoping's uh, normative framework of collective leadership, uh, which was based on consensus building, power sharing and mechanism of orderly successions. But Xi Jinping and with the 19th Party Congress, we are seeing that this has been completely defied. And unlike his predecessors, we see Xi, by consolidating, uh, consolidating his power, has dismissed the political precedence of Tang Xiaoping that was set in to maintain orderly power transitions. And as evident from his lifting up of the presidential term limits. So... Tang Shao, uh, so therefore Xi Jinping has defied what Tang Xiaoping uh, has brought into practice in order to bring a greater democratic practice in terms of collective leadership. The second one is with Xi Jinping's uh, infinite rule, we are saying it has put a stay on the one party, two coalition system. Because we know that China must be, the CCP is one party, but it has two coalition. One is the elitist which is mainly princelings, Xi Jinping being part of it. And the other is the populists or the Tuan Pais, which are mainly for the communist youth league, what Hu Jintao was part of. But now with Xi Jinping, we see that another, this is another characteristic change that, you know, there has been a stay put on the one party, two coalition system. So therefore, with these two major changes in the political thinking or the apparatus of uh, you know, change of leadership in China, it has further narrowed down the scope of any form of democratic reforms in China. Rather, we say that indeed, uh, with Xi Jinping coming in power, one can say that it is a one-man role that China is, you know, envisaging or leading into. 
Then coming to the PLA's actions, uh, we see that it's distinctively now defined or defined by the guidance of Xi Jinping and in concert of the party leadership. So it is she at the helm of affairs. So when says top down approach, or uh, you know, to, uh, to, when say that it was uh, mediated from the top, when it say the top top means Xi Jinping, there is no intermediaries in between. Uh, so PLA cannot exercise any form of self-motivated actions anymore. Therefore, leaving no score for the PLA to dismiss or overrule Xi's command. Therefore, Xi wants to make it his army than the party's army. And it is very much evident from his way of continually seeking you know, loyalty from the PLA. So now it's a new addition. We don't see just loyalty to the party but loyalty to Xi Jinping so this also says that you know it is Xi's party so PLA then as then being a party's army it is now can be well captioned as Xi's army therefore the outcomes of Xi's command how do you then see China and the new trends an aggressive and assertive and non-compromising China, which has been very dominant. And uh, so, and Xi Jinping's speech uh, on 1st of July, further, you know, it has uh, bolstered this attitude when he says that, you know, we are not going to tolerate any kind of bullying activities and that the idea of a uh, steel wall of 1.4 million billion sorry no more hiding or biting because it's a total departure from Tang Xiaoping's uh, uh, theory of hide and bite because now we see a much more confident China which is ready to showcase and not ready to hide or bite any form of time and it also because and this is also evident from you know she's attitude of giving timelines that you know it is not in any form of biting for long but rather work with this calculated approach that is also bringing immediate effects. Nationalist China, we are dealing with a nationalist China. So this is also another, uh, you know, attribute of Xi Jinping's China. Ambitious China, we have seen that, you know, in its unilateral activities that is taking place. So that brings in that where China is seeing itself in terms of its power, its strength, at the global order. Well, and now with COVID-19, of course, we saw a wolf warrior China, a revisionist China, of course, because China has often been uh, criticized for not being a status quo part, but also a new trend that China needs to note is that of China becoming an isolated country that is going back to its state in 1949 that, you know, the sense of isolation it faced under the, the Mao's China face. So if we are seeing under Xi Jinping a common trend now shadowing or casting a shadow on China that is of that of an isolated China in the global sphere. But does that mean that she is completely protected and insulated and there are no challenges to Xi's power? One needs to take this with a pinch of salt because no one is all powerful and so is Xi Jinping. If he is amassing so much of power, it also reflects his insecurities. And there is a greater question of loyalists, you know. One can't discount that there is no factionalism because as Xi grows in power and with his activities and mostly by having the crackdown on people under his uh, anti graft campaign, she has also created greater uh, opponents and enemies and factions uh, around itself. Therefore, the challenge for China lies in failing to deliver his commitments of a strong China and more primarily as Xi Jinping has been harping on, you know, re reunification, Taiwan. So will she be able to reunify Taiwan? So if it fails, that will be the biggest consequence. 
So, and it is also stated as Commodore Vasan said that of his speech, this was highly one of the most dominant, uh, you know, aspect, the Taiwan factor. And, but it is not an easy task, which even Xi Jinping knows that Taiwan is not an easy task. But Chinese dream is that reunification. If she falters is then the question, because then it will automatically translate into dissatisfaction over Xi's leadership. Rather, dissatisfaction is still an understatement. Both loss of power as well as highest reputation cost, I think so. And one can here draw a corollary to that of uh, what happened to Mao Zedong because his ambitious great lead forward led to a disaster and that led to him giving up on his chairmanship. However, he came back with cultural revolution, which also was a greater, a farther greater disaster causing several challenges to his all-powerful authority. So Xi's power consolidation therefore does not guarantee him an all-weather leadership under his indefinite term. This is a fact. And therefore I would like to uh, end on a note of raising a key question. Therefore, can today's China afford to have a man, one-man rule? And it justifies on the ground that, you know, as China says and often reiterates, that take history as the mirror. So if today China takes history as the mirror, the answer is quite obvious that it cannot have a one-man rule. On that note, thank you for your patient hearing. And I would uh, like to take on the questions and the further interactions. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Amrita. Um, before I hand over to uh, Nisha from Chennai Center for, uh, you know, doing the question answer session, um, I think you have uh, walked us through uh, the key aspects related to Xi's rise and his, uh, his tactics and methods that he has deployed to control the party, the army, the state organs, and put himself above all uh, legal presidents or political presidents. Uh, so that his power is consolidated and his, the need for that also you have indicated. So I think that's given a good panoramic view of where, it's to where we stand today. There have been some good questions on the side. So uh, over to Nisha to, uh, you know, articulate some and get uh, answers from Dr. Over to you, Nisha. Yes, thank you, sir. And thank you, ma'am, for that very uh, comprehensive and insightful presentation. Uh, our first question is from Mr. Rishi Atriya. He asks, does China have any type of a professional armed forces? Is this akin to Iran where there is a professional armed forces and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps? Uh, can you pause? Like, I, I'm not able to get it. Like, can, does China have a professional armed force? Yes. Yes, my, uh, Dr. Jash, sorry, uh, if, if I may. Uh the chair. Uh, what I mean to ask is that in Iran, you have a dual system. You have an Iranian army or a navy, which is a professional force, which is a proper uh, and then you have the revolutionary guard, which is under the revolutionary leadership under the directly part of the sort of a party organ. Of course, they maybe have different roles. One is a, a blue water force, one is a, a brown water force, but is there any concept of a professional army in China or the only army is really a party militia which transformed itself into an army because India we, inherits the professional army from the British days. Yes. Uh, well, if you go to the origins of uh, today's PLA, you know, it was raised as a guerrilla war force and, you know, that has transitioned, but that you can't discount the fact that it is not a professional army. It is a professional army, but what makes PLA distinct that it is a party's army. So, you know, you have a difference between state and party in china the party is above the state so because it is communist party of china that's you know so party is always it's because that is an ideologue that china follows and uh, that doesn't bring any you know uh dent to its status it is far more rather far more ambitious and nationalist to be uh be more specific so. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Balasubramanian from CCS. He asks, what is the military strategy that China is following under Xi? The military strategy that China is following that, you know, the, the current military guideline is winning informationized local wars. And uh, what we have seen that informationization is now transitioned, you know, the last year, 2019 uh, white paper brought in a new factor of intelligization is the new aspect of China under Xi Jinping. And there are other aspects. Under Xi Jinping, we also see the PLA Navy coming into a greater force because near seas to far seas. When you see talk of that, China has expanded its canvas, the security canvas. And under Xi, the cons consistently they are making efforts towards building an expeditionary force, but primarily a force that can undertake joint operations. This is a key trend under Xi Jinping. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is, China under Xi has done a lot on civil military fusion front. Can you share your thoughts on this? Uh, well, um, military civil fusion strategy has become a national strategy of China under Xi Jinping uh, and since 2014, which it got introduced. And what it has done is that, you know, there is not much literature in open, but what we are seeing is it's quite a threatening trend. Uh, and most probably got came into light under Mike Pompeo's, you know, the constant signaling of towards that we need to take stock of military civil fusion. And under this, we have seen that China has integrated universities, research think tanks, so there, even a civilian research has military implications. So your, uh, for instance, the kind of technology or weapon systems that, uh, especially the drone sector or things, it's more like there you see a lot of military civil fusion that is taking place, but not much literature is there in open domain, but this is one thing where US combined. So the army of China is no more the PLA itself. It is the civil force. Also, so that is the logic that what you are doing, that should be at the interest of the PLA or the country's national uh, objectives. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Mr. Shivam. He asks, are there any democratic movements or any sign of rise of democracy in China in the recent years? Uh, well, in the open domain, of course, there is no such that has come. But Protests do happen, which is which everyone is well aware of. That you cannot, uh, there cannot be resentments because we are seeing oppressions. You know, be it Xinjiang, be it Tibet, you have these uh, this uh, antagonism towards the party's activities. But to club it with democracy, I don't think so. We don't see it much on that. Yes. The next question is from the Ayush Mishra. He asks, given the central, centralized nature of ruling by Xi Jinping, as you have described, do you see any possible chances of internal challenges in the future? Internal? Challenges in the future. Uh, of course, as I uh, stated, you know, as I ended that, you know, Xi's challenge is that of uh, given his own acts, there is a rise of opposition to Xi's, uh, to Xi Jinping's power, which was very much evident, you know, under the Wuhan epidemic. You that happened. You see, there was a resentment. But China is, uh, you know, has the capacity of maybe covering it or uh, or diffusing it. But in the long run. Of course, if one man takes so much of power, there has to be a uh, fissures too. So there will be some the challenges ahead. We are yet to see, but yes, no one is all powerful. That's what uh, I would try to re reinstate again. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is: What is it about the unfavorable image that China is battling now? The unfavorable image that China is battling is, you know, quite evident. Uh, like 
how who is an ally to china china till today just has only one ally that is north korea isn't it evident enough and of course pakistan and now new uh, remnants you have turkey and new but when you talk of a major power china aspires to become a great power but we know that great power comes great responsibility that's where china has been battling off the image of to be conceived the you know to be perceived as a responsible actor for say china is not normative china is seen as a revisionist country and a rule breaker so all these activities is something unfavorable is that that you know china is not perceived china is still battling to have that favorable in, image despite you know even if it's uh, doing its uh, uh, currency diplomacy that is not helping much in uh, even bri you know you got to debt trap so there are a lot of uh, plus and minuses that is uh, that has come into play not everything is glorified and of course after covid 19 china is bigger battles to face in terms of its image thank you ma'am the next question is from colonel hari haran he asks in reference to taiwan do you see she indulging in any decisive military action to bring in reunification don't you think politically he can generate enough pressure in taiwan to bring in pro prc government there oh uh, so this is a very timely question and uh, also uh, in my view uh, i feel see political pressure china has been building even before she so all this while but it has failed to do so rather in taiwan we see the dpp or the pro independence force has gained more momentum and under covid uh, you know taiwan being one of the best cases that which could prevent you see greater uh, tilt towards taiwan and a defiance of china's one uh, uh, you know one china policy as we already see how japanese prime minister referred to taiwan as a country so political pressure on taiwan will not lead to reunification of course by hook uh, use of force is one thing that to which you know xi jinping would like to but can he afford to do it right now will be no because if china hits uh, taiwan the answer is clear you are getting into greater trouble with united states and there are now greater stakeholders in the region as well so there'll be many more paths to join thank you ma'am the next question is from uh, dr raja ram mathukrishnan he says an increasingly prosperous china with the fading away of the revolutionary generation ccp and she have resorted to harness support by building nationalism that is defined as supporting and coming together under ccp which is led exclusively by xi is this something that is sustainable in an era where the chinese have had global experiences unlike in the past a uh, nationalism in china uh, the way ccp is uh, pledging is is not an recent phenomena but very much came into practice since 1990s with the national education campaigns that uh, ccp undertook uh, because post tiananmen there was a loss of legitimacy so the currency card for uh, ccp to gain legitimacy was bring in nationalism so you know the anti japanese sentiments and the colonial sentiments and their national textbooks war memorials these are manifestations of the way china tries to revive or work on the nationalist spirit of uh, of the chinese uh, populist so to say that uh, can you follow up the question the second part uh, and with that uh, yes ma'am uh, let me do that because it's my question uh, no no question i wanted to ask was you know i know that that nationalism has always been used as a tool uh, whenever communist party authority is under threat but the point i am trying to ask is in this new era of china which is no longer having those revolutionary heroes Yeah. of the past and a new generation of chinese who are exposed to a global world they have gone abroad studied come back and highly mobile now not like the old china where everybody was closed and nobody was allowed to go to the next town it is that sustainable now to build nationalism in this new definition of nationalism means supporting the ccp which is z 
I will say yes, sir, because this is firstly I'm drawing my experiences uh, for my visits to China and interacting with the youngsters. The answer I see that you know they they glorify Xi Jinping. Why? Because they are born in a China that is strong, and Xi Jinping gives an image of our you know China as a strong country. So they are going to uh, they are. Rather, they give far more legitimacy to Xi Jinping, given what he has brought or the image he has put forward of that you know、uh, strong country image, which was not which was lacking under Hu Jintao. So the the transition that they see is much that plays with them, and they were in favor of that. They are far more、uh, you know glorified with what Xi Jinping、uh, does in and his actions. Like for instance, you know the. The、uh, the embossment of South China Sea on the passports, Chinese passports, that itself was a trick, and which、uh, every Chinese you know, youngsters kept flagging all around that you know South China Sea is ours. So this is how you are trying to play, and、uh, with that、uh, on the minds of your own people. If if it was not that case, how can you amass so much power? That is also there. Even Mao Zedong was there, and it's not like Chiang Kai-shek was a big president, or、uh, he also had that clout. So he has greater acceptance among the young people, Xi Jinping, but not amongst the old, because the old remember Mao Zedong, and they try to draw a similarity that how that was a one-man rule, and under the under Mao, we suffered from cultural revolution. From Great Leap Forward, that they remember, but the younger generation don't have these memories. So that is a plus factor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.、Uh, the next question is from our director, Commodore Vasan, sir. He asks, in light of some reports about the press dissent in the party, hypothetically, what will take the party to start imploding? What would take the party to start imploding?、Uh, would actually has to come from the next gen, the the leaders within. But under Xi, since he has created that loyalist culture, and he knows the who is who, like you know how Mao used to do, like the hundred plus bloom he did to identify his opponents. Xi knows who is his.、Uh, Opponent and who is not, and immediately when he identifies, he cracks down or mutilates. So that's what his approach has been. But how long will this sustain? Is the big question. Like that, how long? How much can like one any human? At the end of the day, Xi Jinping himself is also a human being. So you know how long can you sustain so much power? Because he is not. Uh, he's taking as much as he can. So the imploding can also only come from within, from the other leaders who are in line. So that's what, like, one of the questions that I said that you know his his uh, uh, his taking power has put a stay on、uh, that one party two coalition system. So who knows the next that you know the the communist youth league that you know they are in that factions or other party factions that you found. There are greater factionalism, no doubt, in the CPC. Thank you, ma'am.、Uh, the next question is from Mr. Rishi Atria. He says、uh, Xi Jinping is being described as a centralized power in one person. Earlier, the CCP had a collegiate leadership.、Um, given that term limits have been abolished, what is the scope for change of system in China? Right now,、uh, one can't point to anything because he has lifted the presidential limits. So he is going to be in power. That's what we know as of now. So there is, and、uh, he, and that too, he has done. He has amended the constitution, so no one can defy that. That's yes. Thank you.、Uh, the next question is from Colonel Hari Haran. He says,、uh, "Sinaization of minorities appears to be." She's flavor of nationalism. Is it to reinforce his popularity to become a perpetual head of state? Sinicization of、uh, ethnic minorities. It's making 
more than that it's you know making everyone red i think so that's the approach that uh, because we see a greater crackdown on religion religious practices as well under xi jinping be it christianity of course on islam but uh, also on christianity and of course buddhism is there so there is a way of you know coloring everyone red under one unified identity that you know you can't bring in any distinction rather great as i said that you know unification for national security is the agenda building a, a unified identity is what is in his mind then popularity i think so unification because we know that they might be unified in terms of uh, geography the be it xinjiang or tibet but they are not unified in their thinking and ideology tibet it still is seeking its independence and uh, xinjiang has in its etm movement so we are seeing this so he, he wants to cut those and also prevent any kind of color revolutions thank you ma'am uh, the next question is from dr lv krishnan he asks China is reportedly building security forces to protect its assets outside the country. What shape is it taking? Uh, outside the country, one of the uh, I think the mostly it's evident in uh, Pakistan, especially in CPEC. We see that you know China has built its own. China has put its own PLA forces there because you need to understand at the end of the day, you know, it is. the strategic assets that has been placed there if anything happens there's a greater loss for china because it is aimed at to gain make strategic gains and not for any kind of loss so the if you see it is still not an expeditionary force it is aiming to become an expeditionary force so it is still you know in the grassroots level and one of the only immediate uh you know if you can see that is only in one quarter that is in cpec but not elsewhere uh thank you ma'am uh, the next question is again from colonel hari haran he asks why don't we find women rising to the top leadership of the cpec uh there is a very uh, thought provoking question but we don't see any enough women leadership like at least in the known uh, phase and more than that you know china still is a patriarchal country that is uh, very evident and uh, so that is one of the reasons i can cite as of now thank you ma'am uh, the next question is from commodore vasan sir he said uh, this is on the point made by you about the increased isolation of china due to its wolf warrior diplomacy it appears that she is not to bother though he sent a message to say that there should be an effort to make people love china do you see any changes in the normative behavior if so what form will it take uh that's where i said sir that you know he tried to make peace by calling that you know make china lovable like you know lovable quest for a lovable china but the actions are not uh, words and actions don't match we are not seeing a china that is ready to you know uh stoop down in any form and one of the examples is our own you know at the borders with india we are still yet facing you know the problem of disengagement and uh, it's over in year and still uh, we are battling and rather we are seeing a greater mass or uh, massing of troops on either side so when china says makes a, it's more of you know trying to send a message but uh but it's but your action especially in uh, the wake of the covid-19 pandemic i think so it becomes necessary for uh, xi jinping to make that uh, statement but how sincere he is because his efforts or china's efforts are not saying the same story uh, as it says because if it if that be the case they could have uh, you know they would have allowed for a greater transparency into the investigation of the covid-19 pandemic thank you ma'am uh, the next question is again is from commodore vasan sir he says 
Everyone is clear, including the United States, that China can only be challenged by a united, concerted action by alliances. Yet that has not gained much traction, and still there is a lot of hesitation in taking on China. How do you analyze this reluctance? What are the compulsions in your assessment? Because today's situation, sir, and we have seen the impact of World War II that led to the nuclear bomb. If today the devastation will be much greater, and it will not just be one country but several others. And I think so. Everyone knows that you know your opponent is also strong. That's why you're saying of concerted efforts. And what China can do, no one knows. That's the thing. You. It's hard to predict China and its actions. That in uh, if you and it's it's waiting for the other countries to get provoked because China says that you know uh, uh, like I will definitely fire definitely uh, you know you retaliate once you use uh, when you attack I will definitely attack if you attack. So that is the uh, the standard policy that China is that you know I provoke the others to take that action and then I will take the final call. It's the, and that is where and given that unpredictability uh, unpredictability of the situation, uh, you know it's one cannot take uh, on China and also not that you know what China is. One also has to ask: Is China to re is ready to take on other powers as well? The answer is no, because we are seeing that it, uh, it's consistently trying to test India's resolve at the border. It, if it had to use, why isn't it not using force? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Miss Meena Manoj. Uh, she says, "Can you please give us details of the embossment of?" How China see in the Chinese passports? Yeah, that came uh, in uh, the wake of you know greater assertion because you know that China now claims uh, almost ninety percent in entirety of the South China Sea, and uh, another way of claiming you know symbolism is very uh, an act which reifies your stand. And China has issued passports. The newer passports have. Uh, South China Sea embossed uh, on the covers of the Chinese national's passport. So that's a way of constant reminder to the Chinese citizen as well that you know the South China Sea belongs to China. So uh, no one can you know contest that. It is also a continuation of old Chinese legacy. Yes. Print maps and send claim that whatever is being printed in their maps is theirs. Yes. So that's a modern way of doing it because this is comes handy. So can. And also a signaling to someone else because when you go, a, a passport is something you know which is which travels across. So where it also gives a signal to the other countries wherever you travel. That's a messaging to China, both internally as well as externally. Thank you, ma'am. And our final question is from Mr. Rishi Atiya. He says, "Is there any reason that China will not go the way of the USSR?" Um, can you repeat uh, your voice? Just yes. Is there any reason that China will not go the way of the USSR? Yes, China will not go the way of USSR because China knew why USSR, uh, you know, what led to the fall of Soviet Union economy. China has built a strong economy, and it has survived hundred years. So it will not go that way, and with. If any country has drawn the biggest lesson from the fall of Soviet Union was China, and therefore we see Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up. Well, it was in '78, but after that, you know, uh, the sudden tour of Deng Xiaoping, and in, and we see China into WTO. And today's China, more than communist, is much more capitalist than any capitalist country. You know, so it knows that economy. Keep your people happy with you know that economic car. China is today world number two economy, so it knows. So it is not going to go the Soviet Union. Thank you, Dr. Josh, for very patiently answering all the questions. Uh, with that, we will come to the end of the Q and A session, and I'd like to hand it over to uh, Dr. Rajaram Mukherjee for his concluding remarks.
Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Dr. Amrita, for patiently taking all the questions and for the very detailed and excellent uh, analytical responses that you made to each one of them. I really appreciate uh, uh, your uh, patience with us. Uh, I think overall this session, we've been able to actually uh, get a handle in where the, the journey that the Chinese Communist Party has had over the last 100 years, the current situation where it is currently placed, it has delivered on the promise of a resurgent, nationalistic, prosperous China, but it has not yet delivered on certain other aspects that we expect as world from China. It has, over a period of this 100 years, gone through several epochs within the Communist Party journey, and it has kind of moved a full circle with Xi Jinping establishing himself as the second Red Emperor uh, of the Communist uh, dynasty. And uh, so that's where we stand today, as of now. The generation that is in China today has something far more uh, um, proud to call themselves as part of China. China today and uh, generation of Chinese today are uh, much more, better, much better placed than uh, the years past where uh, they were in the receiving end of uh, many battles and many uh, isolatory activities. So they're able to hold their own today. What does that mean? Uh, whether the Chinese rice will continue to enable a peaceful coexistence in this part of the world and what does that mean specifically to India uh, is something that we need to understand as the party evolves and morphs as the party goes through and will go through surely much more changes no man is uh, completely secure as you rightly mentioned and there could be in the very consolidation of power the seeds of dissent too and we all know that that the, that's the march of time and that's the march of history we have seen that happen in china as well so there's nothing to say that it may not happen the time the shape uh, and the form and the content in which uh, that uh, evolution will happen in the chinese communist party will it be without turbulence with the traditional chinese emphasis on stability even when change comes uh, as a paramount requirement or will it mean uh, a radical change or it will create a black swan moment uh, which will then make an inflection that we have not yet been anticipating so far. Uh, from that perspective, we need to understand the evolving Chinese Communist Party, the era of Tata based ideological driven uh, peasant RB based uh, Communist Party is over, the era of uh, economically strong controlled uh, assets, uh, very strong professional military force, technocratic leadership, control over all aspects of the society, and the delivering of uh, both the human development in DICE's goals, as well as the fiscal and monetary goals, and the overall outreach that China has attempted to make with the BRA and all that, has put, that, uh, has put the country in a position and the party in a position where the expectation also has in increased. To deliver on that expectations, Xi Jinping's position and the uh, overemphasis of Xi Jinping can actually be the cog in the wheel. So if the cog is hurt or if the cog is removed, there, there is a chance that the party can also go astray, can collapse, can splinter. Um, it's not something it looks far-fetched on a superficial level. It looks to be a very calm and stable uh, party organization today. But um, if you know a little bit about China and the deeper inroads and the psyche of the Chinese, there will be a lot more pressures built up as we go along. Uh, we are seeing some rudimentary uh, flashes of that with the new generation non-party um, entrepreneurs like Jack Ma getting silenced the private entrepreneurs who have grown getting pushed back again. Um, the army generals in PLA have been moved across. Uh, the veterans moved and some newer guys who have moved loyalists, uh, loyalists to the G uh, presidency has been pushed up the ranks. Uh, the kind of technological changes and challenges that China is facing, the kind of coalition that uh, and resistance that China is facing post-COVID, 
all of these are also challenges that the party is going to face and the consolidation of power in Xi Jinping ironically becomes its strongest point as well as its weakest point as we see at this point in time and how that will evolve and pan out is something that uh, we will all closely watch learn from an Indian point of view uh, we live in very uh, interesting times as the Chinese would say um, there is also a concerted focus uh, which we need to understand especially in C3S that's been our main focus to give a peninsular Indian view of how China views us and we see the nascent emergence of a very concerted effort of China to build inroads in the southern part of India to build inroads and create their own players of influence within various aspects of Indian society and quality uh, of course it has taken a pause because of the Galvan and its aftermath but it's something that they've been working on and very assiduously creating capacities and capabilities we cannot be afford we can't afford ourselves to be land focused the orientation towards the sea and the indian ocean also warrants the looking of in china of india china relations from the aspect of the maritime connections in our influence in the south china sea east uh, asian uh, region and our connectivity that we want to bring to the continental asian Russian side with the Chennai Vladivostok corridor and all those things are our attempts to kind of understand and respond. Uh, this, this is an inflection point in the historic journey or the trajectories of two very big powers, India in its current rise, as well as China at its crossroads. So I think this discussion and the series that C3S is planning if you incrementally look at all of them, we would be in a position at the end of this uh, series uh, to get a more comprehensive picture of uh, not only the Chinese Communist Party and its uh, future trajectory, but also the fault lines and the potential frailties that uh, was not talked about much about China watchers that China possesses today, both from an economic angle, from the angle of social, social cohesion. There are other aspects to uh, Chinese Communist uh, Party control, which is uh, likely to pose a danger to the stability and the peaceful rise of China that has enjoyed so far. So I think this uh, very interesting and very insightful presentation, very comprehensive presentation by Dr. Amitra Jayash has uh, enabled us to get a better understanding. I'm sure all of us have enjoyed this session and uh, I would like to thank everyone who made it possible to come uh, and um, take part in this webinar and also the very uh, highly content rich and highly insightful questions and the responses to that did add to the overall value of this session and I really thank everyone for taking the time today. Namaskar and uh, we will see you in the next event. Pala, over to you or to Dr. Vlasen for your closing Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, may I request my colleague, Ms. Nisha, to formally present the vote of thanks? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. With that, we have come to the conclusion of yet another C3S institutional dialogue. On behalf of Team C3S, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and appreciate all those who contributed to the success of today's event. First and foremost, I would like to place on record our heartfelt gratitude to our speaker for the day, Dr. Amrita Jash, Research Fellow Center for Land and Warfare Studies. Ma'am, you have brought a lucid clarity to our understanding of the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping. Your presentation on the rise of Xi Jinping, the personal connotation to his political agenda, the enshrinement of Xi Jinping thought, and the shift within CCP polity to a one-man centric party was very insightful. You have also clearly brought out the wider implications of this consolidation of power by Xi Jinping on the party, the PLA, and the future of China, which was very eye-opening. We thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today, and we look forward to having you talk with us again. Our sincere thanks to the moderator for today, Mr. Raja Ram Muthukrishnan, Investor and Director, Voice Snap Services Private Limited, and distinguished member CTS. Thank you, sir, for contextualizing this discussion and highlighting key issues. We have certainly garnered valuable insights from the perspectives you have provided. I would also like to express our gratitude to Commodore R.S. Vasan, Indian Navy retired and director C3S, 
for his direction, support, and the guidance that he readily provides us. I thank the members of C3S for their invaluable contributions brought forward through their critical perspectives and informed opinions that have certainly added immensely to the day's proceedings. This institutional dialogue would not have been complete without the presence of such an engaged audience. Sincere thanks to all of our participants. We deeply appreciate your active participation and the questions you have raised. And finally, I warmly thank my colleagues, the members of Team CTS, Mr. Bala Subramanyam and Ms. Padmashri Anandan for their hard work and continued efforts which have made this event possible. Thank you all once again and Jai Hind. Thank you, Dr. Amrita. Uh, sorry, my camera is not on because there's some issue. Uh, but uh, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, thanks to Raja Ram also for uh, sharing it so well. And all the audience uh, who made it a point to contribute by way of their excellent questions and inter interventions. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful uh, weekend. Thank you, Dr. Jash. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amrita. Very nice. Thank you.